Joel, welcome to the Men Made for More podcast. Stoked to have you on here, man. I know we've been trying to coordinate for a long time, so glad to finally find a time to get you on here. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Thanks for uh, getting up early. I know uh, you're <laughs> three hours behind me, so thanks yeah. for getting up early. Happy to do it. I'm, I'm an early guy, thankfully, but yeah, West Coast, East Coast time zones right. are always always fun to coordinate. But let's uh, let's right. kick things off here to, today by having having you give listeners for those that don't know you your story personally and professionally. Yeah, so I'm a physical therapist. That's uh, that's kind of a given, I guess, on this podcast. Well, I guess you have other people on there, but uh, physical therapist, just like Dave. Uh, um, I grew up in uh, Pennsylvania, kind of in a real small town, really was into sports, like a lot of physical therapists, enjoyed playing sports. So because of that, we ended up in some physical therapy. That kind of sparked my interest. Um, went off to college and actually became an athletic trainer first. So athletic training is a great um, segue into physical therapy. Didn't really know what major when I wanted to be when I got into college, but I was like, I like sports. And so once I got into athletic training, I like the, um, the biology side of it. And, um, I like that actually a lot more than I just liked, um, watching the sports that goes with athletic training. And so, um, I then about halfway through a lot of my mentors, I found out in the athletic training program, especially one in particular was a physical therapist. And I really liked the idea of how many people he was able to help. He seemed like the guy to go to when it's like, Hey, we really can't figure this out or we need somebody to really take a hard look at this. The physical therapist uh, on staff was the guy they would go to. So I thought, that's cool. I really like that guy's ability to help so many people. And so I thought, that's what I want to do. I want that, I want that knowledge, uh, the diverse knowledge physical therapists have to do that. So I um, actually took an extra year of class to be able to apply to physical therapy school just to get all the prerequisites. And um, got accepted and um, went to physical therapy school, enjoyed all aspects of it, but was definitely drawn towards orthopedics. I did that for a year and then I actually took a little brief stint from that to do some pediatric home care, which is a different side of PT. Um, and um, I also enjoyed that a little bit, but it's just a little bit different type of business. So I, um, I really wanted to be able to um, when it came to physical therapy, I, I, I found out I really did enjoy more of the orthopedic population, the adult population than I did the kids. Not that I don't like kids, but um, just if it was something I was gonna be doing for a career, um, working with kids was really physical. And so I thought, you know, I wanna do the uh, orthopedics. So actually, you know, professionally, I've been in uh, private practice for 12 years now. And it's kind of a cool story how that got started. I really wasn't looking to open my own practice initially. I just found uh, an opportunity. It was actually just an ad on Craigslist where a, um, a gym owner had said that he had some extra space. He enjoyed working with physical therapists and just wanted to know if someone wanted to run a clinic out of his spot, which as Dave and I both know is kind of a way a lot of people get started now is in a gym. So that was new on the, but we were kind of maybe one of the first to do it. So yeah, and it's worked out ever since being, being in a gym really is a cool place to uh, have a physical therapy practice. So that's kind of, that's kind of my story, I guess. Awesome. Yeah. And what, uh, yeah. talk a little more on the you know, specific type of people. I know we say like active population mm -hmm. specifically, what does that you look like week to week for you? Yeah. So active population, um, it tends to be, for me, I focus a lot on endurance athletes, which runners, cyclists, triathletes, and then also just the active adult community, which also includes those, um, but other things too, just a lot of tennis, golf. Um, where I'm at here in close, just north of Atlanta, I don't know if we mentioned that, but just north of Atlanta, um, it's actually the largest amateur tennis league in the world is here in Atlanta. So everybody plays tennis. So get to see a lot of tennis players. And um, then the gym I am in also just caters kind of to that demographic. That's probably like 45 to 65, 50 to 70. And so just a lot of people who are at a, uh, you know, place in life where they're aging just a little bit, but they still doesn't mean they don't want to be healthy. They don't want to be strong. Uh, doesn't mean they don't want to be strong. And so it's a little bit about who I treat. 
That's cool. Yeah. And I think the, you know, the endurance side is, is such a cool niche that we're going to dive into pretty deep here too, but the, yep. just the active adults in general of those that there is this shift going on of less of just kind of waiting for aging to happen and, and more of this proactive shift to being like, Hey, I want to like, I want to look good and feel good when I'm 70, 80, 90, not just assuming that, Oh, well, when I'm 80, I'm going to be breaking down and not able to do anything. Yeah, no, I definitely see that. And I think that's something that, you know, you and I and other physical therapists um, really preach with that demographic is, you know, it's, some point unless you're proactive with it you will kind of slowly lose it as far as strength goes and the best way to be healthy is to be strong and not just be you know try to avoid things that you might you know get hurt it's like well I'm gonna work out hard enough or be active enough so that I feel like that I'm confident to do just about anything I want to do and I think that's super important yeah, that's really cool. I, lo- I love that you preach that message too. And let's yeah. uh, so want to kind of transition to our main topic here because I think yeah. the that, like when you approached when you approached me about what you wanted to talk about, we say the cycling scene is really exploding right now, and I, I'm sure yeah. my, my guess at least is that's in large part to COVID situation, gym shutting down, biking still being something that's readily available. And I, I think this is going to be really cool for people that are already in the cycling to find out how to you know up their performance. Uh, mm-hmm. avoid some of these overuse injuries, these things that you commonly see, but also for people that are maybe on the fence. Cause a lot of people I feel like are at kind of a crossroads in their health and workouts right now of they're not really sure what to do. They're maybe going to a, a gym that's closed. They're maybe doing a CrossFit or an orange theory or something. And, and now they're looking for, okay, what I might have to go a different route. We don't know when this, this whole COVID thing is really going away. So I need to find something that I can do. And a lot of people are going towards running and a lot of people are going towards cycling. So for those that are maybe on the fence with, with mm-hmm. not being sure where to go, what, what would you say are some of the main reasons someone should consider investing in investing time and money into cycling versus building out a home gym or going a different route? Yeah. So cycling, I think, um, provides a really unique opportunity because there's just several different things that I find that that are really positive about cycling. Um, But yeah, first of all, you're absolutely right. Cycling has exploded so much so in that people are having a hard time even finding bikes to buy. Um, And the other thing we found at least locally here is with bike shops, it's almost a month waiting list to get your bike worked on. So people have dug their bikes out of their garage or, you know, shed or whatever the basement and are are using them. So it's most people, I mean, most, I don't know, most people know how to ride a bike and, and maybe rode one as a kid and enjoyed it. And depending on where you live, I would say the first thing that's really nice about becoming a little more efficient at cycling is it can be a mode of transportation. So, and, and this is, this, like I said, it can be dependent on where you live, but as far as, um, a a way to get a little more exercise and that's kind of what we all need right it's like how do we get a little more exercise or calorie burning or just you know not even necessarily calorie burning but be a little more active during a week when we live in a society right that we're basically tied to our computers most jobs so it's like how can you find even if it's just an extra half an hour here or there where you are moving instead of sitting or or being or, or you know or being still so um Taking up cycling, finding a way to actually use it as a mode of transportation, like I, I'm able to do this. I rode bike to work today. Um, it only takes me about 35 minutes. It's nine or 10 miles um, each way. And I mean, the benefit of being able to just have that little bit of active time before you get to work and then get a little bit of activity on your way home. It's just amazing it, what it does for you just mentally, what it does for you physically. Um, you feel good. You're not burning any gas you feel like you're doing something that's good for the environment too so it's it's really cool so i would say that's the first thing as you consider cycling is if um if you have a way to use it as a mode of transportation it's really cool way of doing things um the second thing is um it is a sport that tends to have a little less impact maybe on some of some people especially maybe if you were a little older who were like you know i got a little bit of arthritis in my knees maybe in my ankles or my hips and things like that, it tends to be um, a pretty low stress on your joints. So that's really, um, 
an easy way to, again, get out there, be active, and not have to worry about so much of having a lot of pain. Although there is ways that you're going to have pain on the bike, and we'll probably talk about that. <laughs> um, the other thing is, and I mean, this is, this is a little bit um, depending on how you are, where you are, and with the pandemic is, I think cycling provides one of the best communities for working out. And that's the thing that really got me into it. So if you think about why we join gyms or why we join any kind of club or, or thing like that, we know we're the most successful when we're surrounded by other people. And cycling, um, there's, when, when you find another cyclist, it's always kind of like, and it's the same thing with running and things like that. Well, hey, we should go run together. Or, hey, we should go cycle together. Or, Maybe you're even a CrossFitter. Like, oh, you should come to a, you know, this gym or this event with me. And, and so the fact that it provides that awesome community, again, is really what helps you then stay more active. I actually am blessed to have a lot of cyclists that live really close to me, even in the same neighborhood. And so I know if they weren't there that I would probably ride less. Just I ride more just because I know they're going to be like, hey, man, can you, are you riding this weekend? Or can you ride tonight? What time do you get home from work? All that stuff. So cycling always is done best in a group. It's a little bit safer that way, especially if you're out on a road to be in a group and not just by yourself. So that, um, so that awesome community that cycling brings is, is a massive thing as far as you will ride more, you will work out more, you'll be more active if you're in a group. So I think that's what's really cool about it. Now, all that saying, you do just have to be careful. It's up to you with what's going on with the pandemic. Um, you know, some people still in my area aren't riding in some of the groups, but most of us are. Yeah, it's really cool. That's, that's a nice overview of that. Cause I think it's, it is complicated for people. It's not straightforward yeah. of, of, do they want to go all into cycling? Are they doing it for more of their, their everything for health and fitness, yeah. or is it a, yeah. a supplement too? And, and where do you, do you see both sides of it? Are, are people doing it exclusively for like cycling? Is there their fitness, their everything? And, and, or do you see more people that, do cycling as a supplement to other kinds of working out? Yeah, a little, a little bit of both, right? It's like, um, yeah, it's almost during this pan, especially during this pandemic time, it's almost like we have more time. So even us cyclists who cycle all the time, um, if it's your main sport, we're trying out different, like, well, let's go gravel riding, which is a different type of cycling, or let's get our mountain bike out. Cause we just like, we've been doing the same route all the time. But I've also run into a lot of runners then too, who have, who have said, well, you know, I've been running so much because I have a little bit more time that they've taken up a little bit of cycling and I do a little bit of running too. So it is a great, it is a great supplement in that, um, you know, it gives you something different to do. And the other thing that, that I'll mention about how it's a good supplement to working out is it is a sport that um, it's, it's over a long period of time right? Meaning like you, when you go for a bike ride, it's typically um, for a lot of people an hour or more, um, more experienced cyclists like myself, we're doing three, four hours, five hours, even sometimes. So if you look at it from like a, just a calorie burning thing, it works really well for that. So, um, you know, if, if you are say new to running and maybe the furthest you could run is like a 5k, like three miles, that Emily might take you 30 minutes, 35, 40 minutes, something like that. And you may only burn four or 500 calories just, but you feel like, Oh, okay, I did something. But if you take up, but with cycling and you go out on a group ride, it's two or three hours long. You may be burning 1500, 2000 calories, 2,500 calories. And then you actually have to eat a little bit while you do it <laughs> to replenish it. So I think in that aspects, the length of time is also like something that's really cool about it is you actually have these more of an extended period of time of higher heart rate than you do with a lot of other exercises. Yeah, it's really cool. And I think that's, I, I didn't really consider that with compared to running. There's a lot of people hit a cap a lot sooner on running versus cycling. For most people, they can sustain a level of activity for, for longer. And I think that's right. a, cause, cause that's one of the things we want to touch on too, is, is how can, cause you even mentioned it, how can runners use cycling as a way to actually improve their performance and maybe improve their longevity as well. Yeah. So, I mean, just, just mixing cycling in with your running, um, 
again, takes a little bit of, it, it, it evens out the stress over your body. And the running and cycling, even though they use the same muscles in the legs, they obviously use them in completely different ways. I mean, when I'm in peak cycling form, I can ride 100 miles a century and barely have any muscle soreness the next day. But if I go run five miles when I'm not used to it, during that same time, I'll be like super sore. So you're obviously with those two sports um, using different muscles, you're using your muscles in a different way. So it allows you to build just overall strength a little differently. Um, and again, the, um, the way your body uses the heart rate um, during those sports is a little bit different too. So kind of giving yourself a little bit of cardiovascular um, inefficiency by changing it up a little bit. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's the, I use running as a way to kind of keep my heart rate a little higher for like 30 minutes, 40 minutes straight, whereas cycling your heart rate is going up and down a lot for a really long period of time. So, but, um, but yeah, I think, I think runners, again, um, doing some cycling in there, just it, it stresses your muscles the same, stresses your cardiovascular. I mean, they stress, it, it works the same thing, but just stresses it a little bit differently. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's a great way to take some stress off the joints too. I think it's a great way to get a different kind of cardio. I think even for people that are weight training or lifting, I think there's probably some benefit towards doing that too, especially because a lot of lifters hate to run. So Vikings yep. may be an easier way to, to get some of that long duration cardio that can be, that can be harder to get. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, for, in terms of, in terms of starting out though, so if someone is looking to get into cycling, where community was something I know you mentioned, that's a huge piece for, for people getting started, but for those that maybe don't even own a bike or maybe own a bike, but haven't ridden in a while, what would be, a yeah. and I know it's, it's going to vary so much person to person, but what would be some general like recommendations you would make to someone just getting started with this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very similar to other cardio or endurance type sports where you just have to get started, right? Like even with just running, we all know it's just, you know, when we have somebody who's just starting to run, they may not even be able to run that much. Well, you might have them just walk run, right? Like take half an hour and for every five minutes, you know, walk two minutes, jog three minutes. So cycling, you kind of do, it's actually a little, because it's not as cardiovascularly intense um, is a little even easier than running to get into. So what I would say is try to find most, most communities, if it's in a large metropolitan area, have some sort of trail system or, you know, pathway or something that tends to be fairly flat. Um, and that's where I would get started. Just, and it doesn't really matter what the bike is. I mean, people are always concerned, like, well, is my bike, it's like, as long as it's, you know, do a safety check on it or take it to the bike shop, it's not going to fall apart or crash on you and make sure the brakes work and stuff. But I would just go to that pathway system and just start out on flat and just get start getting some miles in. Um, now, if you live in more rural area, then you can go out on the roads. But again, with the roads, be be careful if you can find someone to go with you. Again, um, having a group of cyclists tends to be safer than just being out there individually. But um, and then too, for some people, um, the indoor cycling, there's different things you can put your bike on you know, called a turbo trainer that you can actually start that way. Um, obviously this is a little bit different than a Peloton, but obviously Peloton's just been taking off during this pandemic too. So even if it's something like where you want to ride an exercise bike indoor and split your time between indoors and outdoors, that's another good way to get started. But um, yeah, just get out on your bike, go for a ride. Again, if you can find a buddy to do it with, even better. Just get started. I love it. Yeah. What, uh, what kind of things should people be considering if they are, they kind of fall in love with biking, they, whether that's Peloton indoor, whether that's outdoor or combo of both, what other, let's start with cross training recommendations should people consider? Because at least I've, I've seen some imbalances occur from people that only are on the bike and not doing other cross training stuff to, uh, to supplement that. And I, I would assume you've seen some of the same, what are some cross training recommendations that you would give to someone who's primarily doing cycling as an activity yeah well we'll go back to running obviously like i um running's where i would start first as far as just making sure you don't get so 
it's tucked into this tiny little cycling posture that you can't upright run. Um, I try to make sure every single patient of mine, whether a cyclist or not, can run because that is the lowest barrier to entry of, of any sort of getting some activity done, right? It's just like, doesn't matter where you are, as long as you have some shoes on or maybe not even shoes, you can run. So <laughs> just everyone should know how to run even just a little bit. Um, so there's that. And then, you know, just the, the exercises that I recommend for a lot of the cyclists is a lot of stuff that isn't in just the forward to backward plane, we'll call it, you know, like that both runners and cyclists do. It's like get into some diagonal stuff, some side to side. Um, I talk a lot about it in my social media is the Turkish get up. Um, probably a lot of people don't know what that exercise is. You can look it up, but it's like a, the perfect exercise to kind of make your body move in some planes you don't normally move in. And so I think that's the perfect exercise for runners and cyclists to make sure that they have continue to be able to do stuff outside of their sport. And, I'll, and then obviously just, you know, the yoga and the Pilates type of stuff, again, great ways to maintain your flexibility so you don't just get stuck in that one um, that one posture. Um, the other thing too is cycling is, um, depending on where you live, if there's some seasons, has a little bit of a seasonal element to it um, based on sometimes on how when the days are shorter, you just aren't riding as much because you don't have as much daylight. So kind of during the off season, during the winter, I do recommend and there's um, programs for this of cyclists doing weight training. So training your legs, doing the traditional squats, the deadlifts, and things like that are beneficial to actually becoming a better cyclist and stronger, faster cyclist, especially if you're more of a performance-oriented cyclist. So that's, that's a really important part of cross-training that a lot of endurance athletes don't do, like runners and cyclists, because it's like, if I liked weightlifting, I wouldn't be a runner or cyclist. <laughs> I'm a runner or cyclist because I don't really like doing that stuff, right? And vice versa, the weightlifters don't like running. So, but it's really important, and I do a lot of running workshops um, along with the cycling stuff, is teaching endurance athletes how to strength train and finding someone in your area that can kind of help you with that. Hey, I love that you bring that up because that's endurance athletes do not like to strength train typically speaking, but the, they miss the importance of it from a longevity standpoint of if you can better learn those things and better complement the things you're already doing so much, it, it can help from a longevity and sustainability standpoint. But think if, if your squat max say was 150 and you got it up to 200 even. So you made a, a modest jump. That's more force you're putting out with every, every pedal on the bike, every stride when you're running and people don't realize that that strength component, even though strength and endurance work, work differently for sure. But even a, a fraction of a percent more, every stride is going to lead to faster times and better, better performance. But people like to take their weight training, the endurance athletes, and they'll do sets of like 15 or something at a, at like 20% of their one rep max. And then that's just reinforcing what they're already doing. They're already getting enough of that very sub max load while they're running or biking. So actually, and you're actually saying train the, the top, not the, not like a one rep max, but a higher percentage of strength. Yeah, for sure. No, you definitely want to get to, you know, do a routine where you're building more for strength and power than just like endurance. Like you'll get plenty of the endurance muscle when you're actually riding in the season. And again, as you, as you get into the season, especially if you're someone who races, even if it's amateur, you know, just during amateur racing and stuff like that, you want to be, you do want to be very sport specific at, to perform. But during those off season months, kind of like from, you know, November, you know, November, December, January, beginning of February, that's the time where you can actually do a little more cross training, but actually lift your legs in a way that, um, you know, builds more power and just overall strength. And you will benefit from that once you get back on the bike or get back running again, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's great. I think that's, if there's one thing the avid cyclers can take away from that, it's, it's definitely some, some strength training, some cross training does play a, a big role in, in performance and sustainability on the bike. Yeah, for sure. What yep. about, uh, let's, let's, let's talk about mobility stuff as well. Cause that's another mm -hmm. common topic. I'm yep. sure a lot of, a lot of info out there on, on what, 
mobility exercises cycl- cyclists should be performing, but w- what do you tend to see yeah. as the, maybe the common trouble areas for cyclists? And then maybe say one, one or two examples of some general stretches you'd recommend for that as well. Yeah. So I would say, um, so the two main areas are probably like the hips and the hamstrings, right? So your, um, and this is especially for cyclists as they age a little bit, you, if you, you actually need to bring your, your leg up in a, into up towards your pelvis when in the upstroke of the, of pedaling. And, um, if you kind of run out of hip range of motion there, cause things just kind of get tight, then your knees will kind of track to the outside or the inside a little bit as you're trying to avoid some of that. And then that also plays into your back happening, right? So it's, uh, some, so if you're, if you're bringing your leg up and your pelvis has to make room for that, the pelvis will kind of rotate backwards. This is like this, it's like doing a squat, right? So you get that posterior pelvic tilt at the bottom of the squat where you're kind of at the bottom of a squat position almost when you're cycling a little bit, not quite that there. But then the um, pelvis rotates backwards and then that can kind of round the back out a little bit, whereas you want to keep the spine in neutral. So a lot of... Um, a lot of hip mobility, just making sure there's a variety of stretches that you can do with bands. I know you do some of them, Dave. Um, I do them. They're on my stuff too, where you can go through and use the band to kind of mobilize the femur in the hip socket a little bit to be able to keep that flexion. And then just hamstring mobility. Obviously, in the pedal stroke, don't completely straighten your leg out. And so the hamstring can get tight. You do actually use your hamstrings when you cycle if you should be, if you're not, there's probably a fit issue there, but, um, but the hamstrings do tend to get tight on people. And then the other thing too, would just be back extension mobility. Again, we, and all the way through the entire back, we tend to be in cycling in a very kind of closed position where we're flex forward. It's like sitting at a desk. So <laughs> typing almost, except your hands are on the handlebars, not the keyboard. So just like you would tell someone who is uh, at, sits at a desk all day to get up and do some back extensions and to stretch their shoulders out, um, you know, even lay long ways on a foam roll, you know, is another good one to kind of like get your, um, your get some chest mobility, some thoracic mobility, but yeah, standing back extensions. There's, I've had patients where, you know, just during, even during a ride, they have to kind of stop and do that because, Cyclists can get sciatic pain just like somebody who sits at a desk all day. So those tend to be the those tend to be the main ones. There's there's also some stuff with the neck and head position, but that gets a little bit more into um, bike fitting, which I can talk a little bit about if you want me to too. Yeah, let's dive into bike fitting because I know that's yeah. for people. Mo- most people, I'm guessing myself included, have no idea yeah. what a proper bike fit is if if you don't go see someone to to get help with it. Yeah. So, so the, you know, the human body wasn't made to ride a bike, right? I mean, it's kind of an awkward thing. And so in bike fitting, what's really important is just little, little changes here and there can make a massive difference because when you're pedaling, and I should know the number, but I mean, it's probably, you know, how many strokes per hours in the hundred thousand or something like that. So it's, it's like one of the most repetitive kind of things because you're going you're going at a, um, you know, you're going at a rate that is, is really, really fast. So, I mean, a lot of times you're pedaling at, um, you know, uh, I forget what the, um, just slipping my mind as far as like how many strokes per, um, like what, what are, what are RPMs are and stuff like that, but it's, it's well over a hundred. And so, um, because of that, there is a lot of overuse just like with running. So when you're new to cycling, especially, you're going to find there's a lot of things that kind of hurt. And most people have no idea, like, is my bike too big? Is it too small? Is my seat too high? Is it too low? And I mean, it's, and especially for amateurs, I mean, you, all you have to do is kind of go ride down your local path and you'll see people with it way too low. It looks like a guy's riding a little kid bike or people look like they're falling off, their seat's too high. So there's, there's a lot, lot of things that you will see. But yeah, getting a bike fit, and typically this is done, I would say, you know, nationally, most bike fitting is done at a bike shop. Now this, depending on the bike shop, could be good or bad. A lot of, unfortunately, a lot of the 
bike fitting right now is industry driven, meaning like the large bike brands like Trek and Specialized and Giant have developed their own systems and they're designed that somebody at a bike shop can do. So they tend not to be as trained as well as maybe someone who's a professional bike fitter because they're basically taking the human body and they're just plugging it into this algorithm. It's like, well, your knee should be this angle, your hip should be this angle, your shoulder should be this angle. But as we know, as PTs, everybody's really, really different. And a lot of us are asymmetrical. So it's, a, it's not a bad place to start. You know, if you, what I would say, you know, my advice for your listeners as far as people are just getting into cycling, one, buy your bike at a bike shop. It's going to cost you a little bit more, but they actually will keep you from making a mistake instead of just, you know, going on Craigslist or eBay or something and being like, oh, small, medium, large. Well, I guess I'm a medium. You know, there's a lot of different measurements. So get your bike at a bike shop. They'll help you get something that you'll actually use, right? The last thing you want to do is buy a bike and have it sit in the garage. But then instead of like, um, you know, I would say the next thing you'd want to spend your money on is the bike fit. I mean, you can see um, I mean, I can, I see you on Facebook groups all the time where it's like, man, I, I should have done this a long time ago. So, um, yeah, instead of getting like maybe a lighter weight part on your bike, or if you, you know, if, if it was the difference, like if you had a $1,500 to spend and, and I would say buy the $1,200 bike and get a $300 bike fit, as opposed to getting the a half pound lighter bike at 15 for $300 more, right? The bike fits that much more important that that will give you far more power and comfort. You'll actually enjoy riding the bike. So that's, I would say buy a cheaper bike in order to get the bike fit. That's how important it is. Um, but yeah, then there is, depending again, where you are in the country, there is a lot of professional bike fitters like that as their full-time job. Those are good police people to go to. And then there's a few people like myself who are physical therapists and bike fitters. We're probably the rarest breed out there. And um, we, and we really excel at being able to help people who have some, some problems with their body on top of it or just ongoing issues. Um, but yeah, there's that, the getting the bike fit um, is super duper important and um, will again, help you actually be a lot more successful at cycling. So get the bike, then get a bike fit. That would be my advice. That's great. And as someone with, with such, such background on both sides of the bike fitting and the PT side of things. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's tie this into overuse injury, back issues. We've mentioned probably some neck issues, some hip issues, knee things, knee issues, those things can all come up. How much, and you don't have to throw a set percentage on it, but how much do you see is that a bike fit issue versus how much is a, a physical therapy movement body imbalance that needs to be addressed? And where do you, where do you start people on one side versus the other? Or do you attack both sides of that? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's the, I would say for most people, it tends to be a bike fit issue, believe it or not. Like if a cyclist calls me, and they're having some pain. Um, I mean, you have to first see have they've gotten a bike fit before, and even then it could still be the bike fit. They just may not have gotten a good one. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a whole, just like anything in medicine, a kind of a whole history taking process to kind of determine what the issue may be. But um, for a lot of cyclists, because it's such a repetitive uh, sport, it's if someone calls and they say, hey, I'm a cyclist, I've been experiencing some knee pain it's almost um I almost always have them bring their bike in you know right from the get-go because a lot of times it could be just this little simple thing on their bike that I can fix you know raise their seat up or down or just forward and back that will help that instead of saying hey let's go through this whole um you know protocol of strengthening and rehabbing and things like that so um yeah, cyclists, I almost always look at the bike fit first. And then, but I mean, there's always, you always do a physical exam, at least as a PT bike fitter along with it just to see. But um, I see more, when, when there's a cyclist who's in pain, I see more issues on the bike side of, bike fit side of things than I actually do on the physical side of things. 
That's interesting. I don't, I don't know if I would have guessed that, but I guess it makes sense. I yeah. compare it to someone that say is having back pain with deadlifting, but their mobility checks out pretty well. They're, they're fit right. people that have at least a good base of strength and, and maybe sometimes even in the right areas, but they might just be squatting their deadlift or they might not know how to, and it's yeah. instead of overcomplicating the, the approach and picking apart all these little weaknesses can sometimes just be like, Hey, we need to teach you how to use your hammies and your glutes more when you're doing this. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you just, yeah, you kind of start with the simplest thing first, right. Which can be, all right, well, let's just make sure the bike fits first. You know, let's make sure that's fine because that's an easy thing to do is just adjust that. Now, if they continue to have issues, that's when we'll, you know, look at some of the strength and flexibility and some things like that. And a lot of times with endurance athletes, it's the overtraining, right? That's the other thing that comes up in history. It's like, okay, you've been having this pain, is it only when you ride? And then like, what, what has led up to this pain, right? Like I, when the pandemic hit, I started riding a lot more because I didn't have anything else to do. So I was getting some knee pain, you know, that I wasn't getting before. Now it was just my body getting used to the increased mileage. Like there wasn't anything different, anything other than that, just like as if you were a runner and you started to run a lot more than you're used to, like your body just has to adapt. So, but yeah, always check the bike fit first or do the easiest thing first and then look at the physical thing alongside of it at the same time. That's great. And yeah. I want to touch quick on the training volume piece because I think that's big regardless because mm -hmm. that applies to cycling, that applies to running, lifting. Yep. I'd be curious your, your stance on it because we, we talk a lot about this, but how much is, like, how do you manage that volume for someone that is experiencing maybe some pain or how do they know that they're starting to get into that overtraining line? And then how yep. much is managed through, is it purely managed through volume of just working below that? Or are there ways to actually build your capacity to, to handle more? Oh yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, with the, with, with any of this stuff, right. It's, it's it, what I always tell people it's, it's the time period, right? Like it's the amount of time that I look at first, like how quickly or slowly should you be ramping up? Right. And again, in a, and in a perfect world, we can ramp the, the frequency or the amount of time with the intensity, right? So with, so with cycling, it would just be like, okay, if you're first getting started out, let's say you're going on three rides a week and they might only be, you know, 10 or 15 miles. So it's like, all right, do that for a while. And then maybe on one of those, add like some ways to do some hills in there to make it a little more intense, right? But still keep those three times in those three mileage. Then it's like, all right, now let's increase the mileage a little bit. And so you can kind of slowly build it, build it up that way. The same thing is for, is for running. So, um, that answer your question. What was the other, what was the second part of that question? I forget. That. So talk about that's managing the volume yeah. piece of it. How to, yeah. how can people try and boost their capacity to, to right. handle more? Yeah. So, so with an, with endurance stuff, the key is, is measuring, is managing that intensity, meaning like, um, it's important to be have some really intense things. So I try to do two intense rides per week if I'm going to be trying to increase things, but then also riding or running in between. So you always have to be um, pushing yourself a little bit if you want to improve. I mean, that's kind of basic knowledge. For me, I usually, because I ride in groups, there the groups, and this is something people may not know about cycling groups, there's always levels in the cycling group. So let's say a group is like 60 people. There might be three groups of 20. Group one's the fastest. Group two's a little slower. Group three's the slowest group. So you, the way we do this in groups is I always, when I started, I was at a pretty low group. And then I, at some point I felt like, well, I'm getting, I'm doing pretty well in this group. I'm going to try for the next group. So you go to the next group up and then as happened to me, it's like 10 miles in, I got left in the dust. <laughs> so um, the nice thing is in cycling groups, they, they tend to ride in the same route. So if you get dropped from one group, you just keep riding as long as you know the route and there's little computers we have to have the maps on or use your phone. The next group will come and pick you up. And then the last group won't drop you, meaning like the last group who is the slowest of the groups, that's what we call a no drop group. So they just make sure everyone finishes. But yeah, it's um 
you know, doing that in the group setting, that's really kind of easier to do. You just keep trying to get into a faster and faster group on your own. Um, that's typically where, I mean, simplistically just try riding a little farther, a little harder, and just kind of space it out over time. Um, people are really serious about it with any sport, get a coach, right? And they, and like a cycling coach or running coach or even a weightlifting coach. And they're the ones that are trained to kind of um, draw like a nice map for you of how to do it. Yeah, that's, that's good. And that's the, a, g a good rule of thumb with the biking stuff to, and the importance of community keeps coming back of having, yeah. having a community, having a group around definitely helps. And then some of those other things, the, the strength training stuff, those things can help slowly boost that up as well and make you, make you more resilient. Oh, yeah. And then also the yeah. things that could maybe not, it, they could bump you up, but can definitely pull you down is poor management of nutrition and stress and sleep. And some of those other things we talk about can definitely lower your capacity to handle, handle some of the volume. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, um, I do find overtraining in some of the cyclists, even some of my friends and stuff like that, where they feel, um, I don't know. It's kind of like just with anything in cycling and running endurance sports, there's kind of some peer pressure to how much mileage you do. Right. It's like, you feel like, all right. And even the programs we use to track our stuff, there's little, you know, goal settings in there, which can be good, but you can almost, um, you can almost overdo it where it's like, Oh, I've got to, um, I've got to get some miles in. And so you, you go longer or you just go ride even when you're tired. So, I see, I don't know, it, it's, it's a balance. I see a little bit of both people who overtrain and then some people who are trying to do big events or who undertrain too. But um, you're right, the, the nutrition and the sleep, especially during the summertime, like when I do my big rides on Saturdays, and like this Saturday we'll probably do a at least a 100 mile ride that'll be going up into, towards some mountains and stuff. It's like even Friday morning I'm thinking like, maybe I'll have one less cup of coffee, right? You know what I mean? Like, like, all right, if I, I got to get really hydrated on the day before, right? Like it's, so it's like, all right, if I have my second cup of coffee, does that mean I'll become a little dehydrated? You know, I won't be, be retaining as much liquid because of the caffeine. And then that night before it's like, all right, I'm going to see, you know, make sure I have something, you know, that's a little bit more, uh, rich to eat or you know a lot of calories a little bit bigger meal because i know i'm going to be out on the bike for five or six hours so yeah all things considered more th more that goes into it, and that's i think if people pick up anything from that people tend to be so focused on maybe okay i'm, I'm going to be biking in a couple hours so i need to start preparing now but it's like that's at least 24 hours especially if you're pushing some of those longer rides yeah no you once you get into doing longer rides or more intense events it's almost like you and uh, I've questioned my friends about it. Most of them are that way. You almost have to have a routine, right? And you're, and you kind of learn what can, um, what can my body handle and what's my routine, my morning routine. I mean, when I, for my Saturday rides, I almost like, it's like clockwork. When, what time I get up exactly when I eat prior to the ride, at least an hour before the ride, I eat the exact same thing. I have my water bottles prepped the same way. It's almost like the more routine oriented you are, your body kind of knows what's coming. And, um, and then you kind of get used to, um, you know, what you can eat during the rides too. Cause some people just have a harder time consuming calories during intense physical activities. So there's a lot of different ways you can do that. So. Yeah. yeah all, all good things to consider. I think that's yeah. where people don't realize the importance of, of having that routine though in place and being one, make sure you don't miss anything. I'm sure. But two, like you said, getting your body, getting your mind, right. Some of those other things that are so important for that. Yeah. Yeah. No. You, and, and, and like you said too, getting a good night's sleep, I always, you know, even though, even though it's Friday night, that might be a night where you're like, Oh, I'm going to stay up a little bit later. I try to still get to bed at my normal time. Cause I'm getting up pretty early. Um, I'm not, I'm not a drinker, but I mean, there has been people shown up to the rides who are like, Oh, you know, <laughs> I might have, <laughs> I might have drank too much last night or something. That will definitely hurt your performance too. So it's hard to be disciplined on a Friday night for for a lot of us to be able to put out a hard physical effort the next day. Yeah, no, whatever your whatever's coming up though. If you are trying to push that, if it's more performance based or more just community based, if you're just looking yeah. out and do a leisurely ride, then 
I guess that's a little different maybe than if you're yeah. really trying to pu push their performance. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, awesome, Joe. It's been some fun stuff on the biking side yeah. of things. I want to transition yeah. here into the, the last part of our show here today. And when I originally yeah. approached you with it, uh, we talked about the importance of wanting to make it more than just the health and fitness side of things, even though it's something we're both so, so passionate about, but also just the sure. overall practicality of, especially us as men, being a, being a man in, man in today's world yeah. is, can be a tough place to, to navigate. And looking from the outside at your, at your life and looking at successful business and great family and man of faith and successful yeah. in fitness and all these things going, going right for you from the outside. But we both, we both know that that's not without struggle. That's not without challenge or any of those things. And we've both had, had plenty of those. And I'd be, yeah. uh, it'd be great if you could, you know, if you don't mind being, uh, authentic and open with, with listeners here of what's a, you know, what's a struggle you've had to face as a man, either previously or something you're currently going through that's challenged you and, and actually been a catalyst for, for growth in your life. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, challenges for me are, it is a lot of it is just being a, a businessman. And, um, and as a, as a guy, um, who's a Christian, you know, just trusting God with that, with that side of the, of my life. It's, it's something where you, you see a lot of, um, I don't know, you just see a lot of people around you doing things and they're being successful in different ways. And you're thinking like, well, do I, you know, it's, there's, I think we can easily fall into a comparison trap. And I think I've done that in the past. Right. And, um, where it's a little bit of, you know, I need to achieve these certain things because my other people are, but at the end of the day, that's not really what it's about, but it is something that I struggle with. Right. And, um, and just being authentic with who I am and knowing that, um, who I am in my relationship with God and, and, and with my family is what's most important and not, um, and being satisfied with that. And, and that's, 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 that's been a struggle at times, but something that I've learned to, um, learn to deal with for sure. That's awesome, Joel. I appreciate you sharing that. I know yeah. it's in some that I've, I've gone through, I'm sure plenty of people listening have because comparison is, can rob us of, of so many things and makes us think we're supposed to be at a certain point when there's, there's just too much that, that goes into that. Yeah, for sure. And, um, yeah. And I mean, the other thing, you know, just as, you know, just, um, as we kind of prep for this call, just something that, you know, where, you know, something I want to share as far as, you know, my, my growth over the years of being, um, I'm almost 45 years old. I have, um, you know, I'm, I'm married. I have two kids. I'm in, in business and stuff is just the importance of the, uh, relationships from the top down in my life. And so, um, you know, for me, as I mentioned, as someone who's a Christian to be able to from, it's like these, these relationships all feed off of each other. So the number one relationship at the top is, is my relationship with God and being able to um, make sure that's in the right place. And, you know, and I do that through, again, a routine in the morning of spending some time um, in prayer and reading my Bible. Now, you know, understand not everyone listening to this may have to share the same faith as me. So that might even be just for you a time of gratefulness or thankfulness and um, you know, something like that and making sure that you are grounded as an individual. And, and then because of that relationship that feeds off into my relationship with my wife, which would be like the number two relationship. So it's like if number one relationship isn't where it's going to be, the number two relationship with my wife is going to suffer because I'm not being the man I'm supposed to be. And if I'm not the man I'm supposed to be, then that relationship with my wife suffers. So that's the number two relationship. And then that relationship then feeds down to the kids. Right. And so I always think about that too, with if um, we spend so much time in society today, trying to make sure our kids have everything they possibly need, right. Make, make sure they're involved in everything, make sure they get the best education and all this stuff. But it's like, the best thing for kids is to have a mom and dad who are together and love each other. Right. So it's like, how do I have, what do I do that's best for my kids is actually to love my wife. And how do I love my wife? By having that relationship with God. So that's kind of, you know, if I look at my life and, um, 
you know, kind of the journey it's on and what I find to be important as a man of faith, that kind of sums it up. I really appreciate you sharing that. So well said too, and so well put and whatever, you know, that, that focus. And even though we won't always get it right, but having that focus and focus on those relationships is going to go a lot further in the long run than any kind of external success or things that might come through, through business, through work, through jobs for those places where other people are seeking them. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Joel. And let's, uh, so I do have one more question here, but first I want to, uh, I jotted down a few takeaways from, from this for people listening. I'll, I'll yep. say mine first and then you can add whatever, uh, whatever you might want to add. But for people that are looking to get started, the key is to just get started and just to get out there, we get a bike from a bike shop. It sounds like get a good, mm-hmm. good fit and then just yep. start riding. It doesn't have to, you don't have to have all the answers or the perfect training plan to be able to just get going with it. Uh, second one here is to make sure that you're cross training, doing mobility work and doing some of those other things that get neglected, especially from endurance athletes. So that could be just a mobility routine. It could be some prehab exercises, but especially in the off season, it sounds like is a good time to do some actual strength training. And then last point I had is just to do it right. So if you're going to do it, like I mentioned, go to a bike shop, invest in a bike fitting, seek out a coach if you, if you do need it, but don't skip some of those steps because it sounds like surprising to me, a lot of the problems with people's injuries and performances based on a poor bike fit anyway. So take the time and money to invest in that. And it sounds like your body will thank you in the long run. So those were a few of the things that I jotted down, Joel, anything you want to add to that? No, I think that's good. Yeah. If you, if you, if you want to get into cycling just find a bike and then take it to the bike shop, make sure it works and make sure it fits right. Fix fits good enough. And then just start riding and then, um, once you, once you find if you enjoy it or not, then, then that's where you can invest in a little bit better bike and get fitted on that one too. Bike fitting is kind of an ongoing thing as your performance, uh, increases, but yeah, no, that's really good. Sweet. So last thing here, Joel, our hypothetical scenario for, for all the guests. Yeah. So we're saying you're leaving a coffee shop and you bump into your younger self, younger Joel of 10 years yep. back. And he asks you for some life advice. You're on your way to a super important meeting your time with your family you can't miss you have 60 seconds to talk with him what advice are you giving to him and what are you saying to him yeah so to my younger self I would say um, one get more help from people around you right don't try to always do it on your own Um, it it takes it takes a team of people to be successful and so um, this is something I've recently done in the last couple years and it's helped me quite a bit but the more people that you can find that can help you. You're only so you're, most of us are very good at very few things. (laughs) So, or just even one thing to be honest with you. So get help and then take a little more risks. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty reserved individual. Uh, My wife will tell you that she'd probably tell me to live a little more. So I'd probably tell my younger self to live a little more too. take a few more risks, stick your neck out there and um, yeah, do more. That's great, Joel. Yeah. Uh, had an awesome time today. And let's just uh, yeah. wrap up. Where can people find you, especially people in the uh, greater Atlanta area, endurance yeah. athletes and active adults that are looking for, for some specific help? Yeah, so um, my web, my, my business is called Mission Move Physical Therapy. So missionmovept.com. Um, it's also Mission Move PT on Instagram. Also have a side um, kind of thing that I also do cycling PT. Um, I'm at the cycling PT on Instagram. And, um, and then if you are a cyclist, even at, at any level, I've recently started a cycling Facebook group called the no drop cycling group. It's only a Facebook group. People get on there and think it's an actual ride and want to know when we're meeting and when we're riding. We're not, it's only on Facebook <laughs> and, um, it's a great place. If you want to get into cycling, there's quite about Half of the members are um, very experienced and half are new to riding. It's a great place to come on and just ask some questions. Plenty of people to help you, but look that up if you're on Facebook, uh, the No Drop Cycling Group. Awesome. I'll link those things up in the in the notes as well, too, for anyone that wants quick access to those. So thanks so much, Joel. I had a lot of fun today and a lot of good info for, I learned some stuff too, especially on the, the cycling side of things. So thanks for sharing that and thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it.